Okay, uh, right, this lesson is going to cover uh, your handout called the social construction of youth. Now, the good news is, before we start this, um, that actually this isn't going to be a specific topic that they can ask you in your exam. Okay, um, social construction of youth is something I think is very important and something that when we look at youth culture, it's something that's definitely worth kind of examining. But it used to be on the old specification and it is not on the new specification. However, it's certainly something that I think is important to teach. So um, it's quite useful that it's been in this week that um, you are on reviews, um, you know, doing your review days so that we can go through this. Um, and um, it's unlikely to be something that you are tested on. However, and there's always a however in sociology, some of the key writers that you'll be looking at today will come up. Um, in strapication next year and will come up in the topic itself so you can certainly use what we've got here um, today um, and you can make use of it in those 35 mark essays now um, the first thing that it's going to ask you to do uh, on this powerpoint is to read through this article and i will post the article um, in the uh, in the chat along with the link to this video um, and it is an article that looks at how adolescence is uh, kind of extended and lasting um, from the age of 10 to 24 and previously we would have said maybe it was only to you at 18 or 19 so um, what I need you to do is read that article um, uh, and as it um, as it says here consider what adolescence is like you're in it at the minute so what is good about it what is bad about it what have you got to deal with uh, and try and see how you would explain your adolescence do you think it's a happy time or a bad time if you were going to put it on a continuum um that we've got um at the top you know if the if the right hand side is really really good and the left hand side is really really bad where would you put adolescence um you know what you're experiencing in the moment and why obviously um this is going to be about the social construction of youth so i've got a nice little video uh, which i think will represent the social construction of youth which i'll show you now only 30 seconds to go before I'm 13, 29, 28, 27, boing. Can I have some more ice cream, Mum? Kevin, you've eaten all the ice cream in the house, remember? Oh, yeah. Bloody hell, I'm thick, Mr Bean. Oh, no. Oh, no. 15, 14, 13, I hope it gets Super Mario Kart. Boom, bam, bam, boom, bam, bam, boom, bam, bam. I don't have to go to bed tonight, do I? Yes, in five minutes, remember, you've still got school tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Do Brian. Happy birthday, birthday Kevin. Kevin! Happy birthday to me! Happy birthday to me! Happy birthday, Dick! Go! Go! Kevin! Go! Are you alright? I am alright. Darling, he's losing the power of rational thought. And the use of his arms. He's, he's become, become a teenager. Go! <laughs> Kevin! What? It's your birthday, Kevin. Oh, I know! Happy birthday, Kevin. OK, stop going on about it, will you? <laughs> What's in our bloody ice cream? Oh, come on, Kevin. You've eaten five tubs on your own this evening, remember? Oh, so unfair. I hate you. <laughs> Kevin, don't speak to your mum and I like that. What? I didn't say anything. anymore <laughs> oh well seen as you've started at least it'll cheer him up oh 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 well you said you wanted super mario kart i hate super mario it's sad i want a bloody high five right that's it off to bed I am not going to bed. I'm going out. Oh, don't be so stupid, Kevin. You can't go out now. Why not? Because it's 12 o'clock. It's oh. way past your bedtime. It's pouring with rain outside. It's dangerous for the child on his own. You've got nowhere to go, and you've got school tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh. That is so unfair. I hate you. <laughs> All right, then. I will go to bed, OK? Happy? <laughs> Kevin. Don't bloody shout at me! <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> just a uh, an example of Harry Enfield there, uh, Kevin and Perry. 
um, which will relate to the social construction uh, of youth. And basically, the main debate that we're looking at here is, is nature or nurture uh, in relation to youth. Now, hopefully you already know what we mean by nature nurture debate. Uh, and at the top of your page, there's a, um, a little section for you to fill in a quick paragraph about what the nature nurture debate is using the words that are on the PowerPoint there. Inherited, learned, genetics, environment, behavior. So can you do that now and pause this and fill out that top box? Hopefully you've mentioned um, uh, the fact that nature and nurture kind of relate to biological versus environmental um, impacts. You know, if we think about our nature, it's in our genetics, it's part of our inherited um, kind of predispositions, whereas it's nurture, it's the more the fact that the environment and what we learn from around that is going to be shaping our behaviour. Now, when we come to youth as well, there are both biological and, and, and kind of environmental attitudes towards youth. So the biological approach would assume that um, the biological and physical factors shape your behaviour and that youth is, is a time that's affected by hormones and physiological growth. And you can kind of see the example of that in the Kevin and Perry clip that we just shown in terms of Kevin is, you know, he's 12 right up until then. He's, he's it's you know, it's his 13th birthday and he, he appears to change, um, you know, in a heartbeat, almost like as a biological hormonal change to him. Um, Obviously, with that being a bit tongue in cheek, um, the, the, the alternative side is a social construction, which is going to say that it's social and it's cultural factors which are going to affect um, youth and what we know as youth. And the fact that perhaps the, the period of time that we call youth is, has gone from being very, very short to being very, very long. Um, so at the minute, um, you should be in a situation where and we're on the uh, we're quite far in here on this uh, on this uh, this bit where you have completed the top paragraph, you've written in your definitions for biological and um, social construction of youth, um, and we're going to look through um, through here. So age is a series of biological changes. Adolescence is, off, adolescence is often regarded as a time of uh, storm and stress, mood swings, emotional turmoil, and rest, um, restless search for identity. These mood swings are determined by, or maybe determined by, hormones. Okay, that is the biological view. However, not all adolescents experience storm and stress. The, bio, the biological view is too narrow and perhaps it ignores the environment. These are our two different perspectives. What we're going to be looking at today uh, are these five different ways in which you might be able to tell that youth is socially constructed. OK, and you can see examples of youth being socially constructed in this paragraph here. It said it would be ridiculous to deny biological factors such as puberty, but it's important to consider how we socially interpret these. E.g. girls are biologically able to give birth as soon as they start their periods, but they cannot legally have sex in the UK until they're 16. And that is going to vary around the world as well. It's not every single country that's got the same um, legal age for consent. OK, so um, you've done page one. Now what you need to do is turn to page two where we are going to be looking at uh, anthropology. Now, at the top of page two, you've got your definition for anthropology, which is the study of human societies, uh, cultures and their development. And a very, very famous anthropologist would be Margaret Mead. Now, we've looked at Margaret Mead doing some anthropology before. This was when she was in um, Papua New Guinea, looking at the Chambuli tribe. And she finds how um, when she, she examines the men and the women, that the kind of gender roles that we would typically expect and the gender norms that we would typically expect are reversed, they're shifted. And we used Margaret Mead as an example to show how um, gender was socially constructed because it wasn't the same in the Chambuli tribe as it was everywhere else in the world, which would show the influence of the culture on that particular society. Um, she's also famous for doing another study, which actually she, she does earlier, where she goes to um, what is then American Samoa. So she'll, she'll go to Samoa and she'll find that youth, as we know as, as youth, is very, very different to what we think of in the Western world. So if I think of youth now, most of you considered it at the start of the lesson, you would have thought probably it's a time of turmoil and anger and um, anxiety and stress and strain. Whereas in Samoa, um, that was not the case. Um, and there's lots of reasons for this that Margaret Mead um, that Margaret Mead said. So when you look here, when it says what difficult decisions the teenagers have to make, hopefully at the start, when you considered why it was good or bad, you thought about those those decisions. So as a teenager, you've got to make decisions about your future, you know, your job, 
You've got to make decisions about your education, what A-levels to study. You've got to make decisions about your friends, um, your relationships that you have with potential partners. So all of these things are really, really difficult. You've got to, you know, you've got to play out relationships with your parents and your siblings that might be tough and stressful. Things were different in Samoa. Uh, and we're about to watch a video clip here that explains what Margaret Mead found and why. Um, so I'm going to play this one out and I'm going to pause it and talk over certain elements where I think, um, oh, this is quite important. Far overseas an island is, where on when day is done, a grove of tossing palms are printed on the sun. And all about the reefy shore, blue breakers flash and fall. There shall I go, methinks, when I am done with all. That poem was written by Robert Louis Stevenson about a South Pacific island just like this. It's one of a group of islands known as Samoa, which has charmed and fascinated explorers and missionaries since contact was first made. In the Western mind, South Sea Islands regularly conjure up images of paradise, places where an idyllic climate is matched by a relaxed and harmonious pattern of life. And it's a pattern that has usually been seen as better than life back home. For most of us, these are idle reflections, holiday thoughts before returning to the stresses and strains of everyday life. But for a young American anthropologist called Margaret Mead, the suggestion that life out here had less of that stress and strain was an important one. In 1925, she came here to Tau Island to make, in her own words, a psychological study of primitive youth for Western civilization. She wanted to know if adolescence was always a time of turmoil. Her findings were the start of her fame as the most widely read and the best known anthropologist of all time. When I was a small child, my mother was studying Italian immigrants in the United States. So I grew up with a general interest in other kinds of people and the way they live. And okay, so this is a really old um, um, version, so there are, there are some elements where it cuts out. This is Barnard College in New York City. In 1923, Margaret Mead graduated here in a ceremony that's changed very little from the one you see going on today. Throughout her life, she had a kind of curiosity that enabled her to ask a whole set of questions that normally just don't occur to most of us. They were questions that were important for anthropology and interesting to the general public. This scene flexible, so, but it... uh, when we come to looking at Margaret Mead, um, uh, before she sets out to Samoa, she needs to agree with the person who's in charge of her kind of like university faculty uh, of what she's going to study. Um, and they come to the agreement that they're going to go and look at adolescent girls in Samoa and again see if there's a difference between their upbringing and their experience of being adolescent and American experience of adolescence. I think she was a very remarkable young person who had decided that she was going to show that a woman as well as a man could do field work in anthropology. She wanted her own people, and that meant that she was not going to work with American Indians, where Boaz wanted her to start to work. He wanted, she wanted to go to a very remote place. Of course, that made it more dramatic. Well, Boaz suggested that she go to American Samoa, where a boat came in every three weeks, and there could be communication. Well, she uh, bucked against that a little bit, but uh, she finally accepted it because she knew perfectly well she wouldn't go any place if Boaz wouldn't let her go. Throughout her career, Mead was intrigued by the key stages that all humans pass through as they're born into and grow up in their own cultures. Boaz was at the center of the nature-nurture debate, the question of whether your race or your culture makes you into what you are. He wanted me to study one particular period of life when these biological and social aspects caused most conflict, adolescence. I'm 
wanted to study change. I wanted to find out in a society that was changing uh, whether people felt more strongly about new things or old things. My professor wanted me to study adolescence. I wanted to come to Polynesia somewhere. He wanted me to stay in the United States. So we made an exchange. He said I could come to Polynesia if I'd study the adolescent girl. Most of the gloom about adolescence had come from Germany. They had these terrible words like Weltschmerz, world pain. So that everywhere in the world you were supposed to have an awful time growing up. Nobody knew anything about adolescence in Samoa or Hawaii or the Marquesas or Tahiti. We didn't know anything. Margaret Mead came out here to investigate adolescence in a society completely different from her own. Her findings were startling. Adolescence was known in America and Europe as a period of emotional stress and personal conflict. Now, if these problems were caused by biological changes, and many at the time believed that they were, then they should be found in human societies all over the world. But here in Samoa, Mead found that adolescence was, in many ways, the most enjoyable and happy time of life. Okay, so we've got a difference here according to what Mead's going to be finding compared to the norm. So in the same way that the gender roles were shifted in Papua New Guinea, in Samoa, what we knew as adolescence is a different and um, is viewed and engaged with by adolescence in a different way. It's not bad. It's not the hell on earth that most people think it is. It's viewed very positively. And here are the reasons why. There were many reasons for this. For a start, she found that the culture itself was pretty relaxed and casual. Then there was the whole system of child rearing with its lack of harsh punishment and the large number of adults a child could turn to. Okay, so you've got bigger families, you've got uh, a lot of adults that you could turn to, you've got the fact that it wasn't quite as strict uh, as elsewhere. Those were three big reasons why it was different, but here is the one that was most startling and the reason why Margaret Mead sold a lot of books. The other important reason was the general acceptance of sexual relations between adolescents. Sex was seen as something to be enjoyed in quantity as well as quality before you chose a partner for life. Okay, so there was a lot of sexual liberty in terms of freedom for the Samoan um, girls and boys of the adolescent age to engage in sex with lots and lots of different partners. And obviously that's not something that we would be considering a norm in the Western world. Um, and that was the main reason she said that um, adolescent life was so much better because there were less restrictions and it was a lot more relaxed. <laughs> However, Mead's study is not without some criticism. Um, and you can see here on your page that you're going to be filling out, it says, having watched YouTube clip, how was she criticised? So we're going to start to see perhaps now some reasons why Margaret Mead's study um, was potentially not as sound as you'd think. Do girls here have sex with their boyfriends at your age? No. <laughs> no. None of the girls? No. No. Well, well, no, some. no but, uh, some. Is it, do you consider it wrong because the church says so? Yeah. Consider it wrong. He says, do you consider it wrong because the church said so? So you've got to also think about the fact that um, Samoa then has got very, very Christian now because of the American impact on it. Maybe back in the day it wasn't quite as Christian, and obviously one of the Christian values is uh, is chastity and you know maintaining your virginity until you're married. So Perhaps since it's become more Christian, since Margaret Mead was there, maybe that's a reason why it's different now to, to how it was when she investigated. But it's really up to the girl. You can hardly find girls like that here. You don't. But Margaret Mead said that girls did it when they wanted to before they got married and with who they wanted to. Yeah, it depends maybe on... Maybe that was long ago, but nowadays it's changed. There's a big change in something. Mead was one of the first women to go into the field as an anthropologist. In later life, she remembered what a daunting task this was for a young woman of 23. I think my first field trip was, in a sense, the most difficult because I did a kind of work nobody had done then, so there weren't many models at all. I was just told not to waste my time doing conventional things and that I was to learn the language and get acquainted with the adolescent girls and find out what they were up to. I'd never eaten any food except American food, and I had to learn to eat Samoan food. And also, there weren't any 
styles of work then. In Samoa, I learned to dance and learned to talk a very elegant language. And in return for the help they gave me, I conformed to many of the styles of their society. <laughs> Against the developing trend in anthropological fieldwork methods, Mead chose not to immerse herself entirely in Samoan culture. So, here's one of the big problems. She didn't immerse herself fully in the Samoan culture. Um, you know, it, it wasn't, um, it, you know, it was a qualitative research, but it wasn't a full immersion that we would imagine in, in anthropology. Um, and you'll see a couple of examples why. But she did spend most of her day with the adolescent girls that she was to make famous. Because there was a well-established mission on the island, some of the girls spoke English, and several of them became close friends, which helped her build up a detailed portrait of Samoan adolescents. Which is obviously going to be meaning that your sample is not representative. If you're only talking to the girls who can speak your language, um, you're not going to get a full look of all of the Samoan uh, girls. Those girls that Mead studied are now the elders of Tau Island. It was their answers to her questions about life and love and fidelity that were to have such an impact on the people back home. Some of her subjects still remember those questions. <laughs> Bede's findings were published in her first book, Coming of Age in Samoa. But there are some problems with her account of life in Samoa in the 1920s. Critics have claimed that she missed certain important aspects of Samoan life. She spent only six months on Tau Island, most of that time living with an American family rather than amongst the Samoan people. So as well as having a small sample of uh, people that she talked to, she was only there for six months, which is another big weakness. And here's the main one. This has made people wonder whether she could have really grasped the full complexity of Samoan culture and whether for that matter she could have fully mastered the unusually difficult Samoan tongue. So, could she even speak the language that she was suggesting um, that, that they were talking? That, that's another big weakness of Margaret Mead. So, um, we should hopefully have completed our first page on anthropology and then our next um, part that we're going to is looking at um, initiation rites. Uh, just before you go, if you're on the PowerPoint on this slide, you'll see Mead's findings and the criticisms of those that we've just talked about, staying with the same people in the same village, not learning the language um, and misunderstanding the Samoan culture. Um, now we're going to look at initiation rites. Now, your initiation rites are this. Um, there is ceremonial activity, which kind of are associated with a rite of passage from childhood to adulthood. So it's quite literally an event that means you move from being a kid to being an adult. Now, we would say that that's what you do during your youth um, in, in England. There's no very there's no set ceremony that you have to go to. That means you're moving from young person to, to adult. You, you might say moving from secondary school to college could be the case, but it, it doesn't it doesn't really work like that. It's not set in stone, whereas um, what you've got is uh, on page three, four, five, and six, you've got a series of different initiation rites. Now, uh, some of them, like the Aboriginal initiation ceremony, are quite dark. The same for women's initiation rites in Africa. Um, so don't read those if you, uh, uh, you know, if you've, um, if you've got a weak stomach, because they're not very positive ones. When you've got uh, page um, five with your quinceanera and your bar mitzvah, uh, are a little bit more straightforward. So what I would suggest is you read 
um, one or two of these, um, making some notes about the initiation ceremony in the notes section. Uh, and then on the bottom of page six, you've got a question to answer, which is how does the initiation rites you've read about show that youth is socially constructed? So how do you know that youth is socially constructed um, from reading these initiation rites? Think about the age, the culture, what the ceremony is, how it differs from time to time and place to place, um, and how even what age you're supposed to go from male to um, from um, man or boy to man, sorry, or um, girl to woman is going to be different. OK, now you've got that done. Um, we move on to number three, which is laws on page seven. Um, all I want you to do quickly on this one is, um, is see if you can put in your guesses uh, before you do this as to um, when you think in the UK you're able to do these things. Um, and then uh, what I would advise um, is taking a look online and seeing if you can get some answers to those particular questions. So go through your guesses first um, and then the answers. Have a search online to see when you can. Um, there's a few of these which may um, throw up a bit of bit of a, um, bit of a spanner to the works, especially the go to the pub and not drink alcohol one. That's a bit of a, a, a strange one. Uh, and draw money from a bank account. You might be um, very surprised in terms of bank account opening, uh, what age you're allowed to do that. So go through with your guesses first and then answers on the right hand side that you can go research in your own time. You'll note that when it comes to laws and stuff for America versus the UK, there's a lot of difference. So the age of consent is 18 in America compared to 16 over here. To purchase alcohol, it's 21 versus 18 over here. Driving, it's 16 versus 17. And gambling, 21 versus 18. So perhaps these statistics are going to tell you that you might be treated in a way that's very different um, to um, American um, young people. You might be an adult earlier than we might say uh, in America because you've got the freedom to um, you know, consent to sex or you've got freedom to purchase alcohol um, at a lot earlier age. Um, one thing that's worth looking uh, and talking about here um, is um, is the laws that exist. Um, and basically, there's no laws um, to protect children, really, up until, I mean, 150 or so, 120 or so years ago. Um, we are talking about the fact that until 1889, um, if you were a child at home and you were in danger, there was nothing that really anybody could do. So 1889, the Prevention of Cruelty to Children Act is the first time that, that the police and people could come into your home. And if you were a, a, tr a child in danger of being abused or you know anything happened to you, that they would do something about that. Um, you see then when we get into the 80s and the, and the, and the 90s, um, the protection for children starts to really, really ramp up uh, against exploitation, against potential paedophiles. And then 2004, um, Every Child Matters was created to ensure that the child is at the centre of everything done by the local authority. Previously, around the Industrial Revolution, children were just there to get money for the family. They were potentially a, you know, a source of income. So your idea of, of how you should be treated now as a child and, and the way that children should be protected is a really, really relatively new thing. And I think that might be a bit of a shock um, to some of you that the idea of what a child is, uh, the ages that you are, you know, not classed as an adult, um, are varied over time, even in this country. So um, we are now going to look at um, page number eight. Uh, and this fella called Philip Aries. Now, Philip Aries was a historian um, and he liked looking at pictures. And here are a few of the pictures that he looked at. So in his research, he looked at uh, paintings that he'd seen in medieval periods. Here are some very good examples. Um, that's a weird one. Uh, and in these paintings, uh, he looked at the people who were painted within them. And it allowed him to come to some conclusions about um, what he would class as youth um, and childhood and adulthood um, in and around this period. And if you look here, this is a very good example. What he would say is that there's almost no such thing as a child. What there is are just many adults. 
So when you look at this picture, initially, if I said, well, how many children are there? Well, you'd say probably four, um, three girls and um, and a boy. Um, and then you'll have a, a, a woman there and two men sitting at the back. But when you look at the faces, the only real reason that you recognize that these are young people is because they are smaller than the adults. So Aries would, would very famously say that in the Middle Ages, the idea of childhood did not exist. OK, um, the children began work early and they were just seen as mini adults. They were just small people, small adults. Um, and as such, they were treated and had the same rights, duties um, and were treated the same as adults. Um, and the law often made no distinction between children and adults, with children facing the same severe punishments if they did something wrong, just the same as somebody who was who was a bit older. Um, now, evidence that there was no such thing as as childhood comes from something called the, the Children's Crusades. And there's been quite a few Children's Crusades over time. Um, and the in the Children's Crusades, this is a bit of a, a bit of a weird story. It's a guy called uh, Stephen of Cloyes. Uh, and he's a young 12 year old lad who claims to have read a letter um, or has a letter to the King of France. And the letter is from Jesus. Now, Stephen Cloyes goes around and tells the local people that he's got this letter. And because there's no such thing as a child, really, and children are treated exactly the same way as adults. Back in those days, this 12 year old boy is a master following of 30,000 people who go on a march with him. Um, to try and go and get the king of France to read his letter. Um, in the end, they follow him on a on a kind of pilgrimage to Jerusalem, where all of the ships carrying all of his followers are, are sunk. I think there's only one ship that remains. And um, by then, I think most people have, have got a bit sick of him. But uh, it's a prime example of how back in, you know, a thousand years or so ago, really, it didn't make a difference whether you were old or young or what age you were whatever you said will be treated exactly the same and obviously this is allows the points to see you know 12 year old children leading 30,000 grown people uh, on pilgrimages which i know in this day and age would feel a bit weird so we are going to put um we're going to look at the history uh, of youth and put these uh, in some order on your page so before 1600 at five a child would belong to the world of work um, most of the evidence comes from paintings, and this is the work of uh, Philip Aries. So um, children would be working. And then it takes you from the 1700s to the 1800s, where children were considered this economic asset. During the industrialization period, they are there to provide insurance for their parents and work and put in wages to the family. We see 1800s, 1900s, we're starting to see some restrictions being put in place are for children and for the benefit of children because they've got to do some compulsory education. Um, they're not allowed to be working um, in quite the, the, the strict way that, that the adults were. Then we start to come to a slightly more modern era um, where children are not really there for any economic gain, but some emotional gain. So it's important that we will lavish love and care on our children that we see now. And that's the right way to treat them rather than sending them off to work um, to go and um, make us some money. They've got a parents have got to now make childhood good and fun for their children. And our present day is all about children's rights and empowerment, um, and the fact that um, we need to safeguard children. Um, and of course, that actually now young people um, are the main focus of the economy, um, and they're the ones who are kind of looked at. Um, as biggest consumers in today's society, the ones who are going to be buying things. That's why all the adverts and things and tech, fashion, clothes, you know, um, phones, etc., etc. That's why it's all aimed at young people. So, pause it now. Um, and as you'll see, the PowerPoint gives you what to fill in each of these boxes. Um, we're moving on to our final. Um, our final section, which is the rise of the teenager, and therefore. Yeah, I just all that build up for just that. Uh, so we're going to talk about a, uh, a fellow called Neil Postman now, which is why I just showed you that. 
who's a key writer in the death of childhood debate. And he's going to say that there is the rise of something called the tweenager. Um, and the tweenager is basically a child between 10 and 14. You might have younger siblings, um, brothers and sisters who are with, within this age who have got rid of what we would traditionally say is what a child would be doing. You know, the days of playing out and going in the street and playing football or, you know, skipping and playing hopscotch and all of the stuff that we used to do when we were kids um, is gone. And you've got a group who are 10 um, and 14 year old kids who are, you know, watching a lot of sexual stuff and a lot of sexual content, watching a lot of stuff that is violent in their content. And all of this is because of the media. Um, this would include the influence of, um, you know, computer games, internet pornography and things like that. Uh, and therefore, what you'll see is these teenagers smoking, drinking, dressing in an adult way, following pop culture very, very rigidly um, and probably younger than they should be. Now, um, Postman is going to look at all of these things uh, taking place and start to see children committing what we would class as adult crimes when they're in this teenager period. Um, and a prime example of this will be the case of James Bulger. I know some of you might have heard about that was when two 10 year old lads in Liverpool murdered a two year old baby, abducted and murdered a two year old toddler from a Liverpool shopping centre, took him by the uh, the train tracks and, and did horrible things to him and killed him and left him on the train tracks. Um, and that, if you want to look up at that case, then you can do. But that um, that idea um, is that they they were kind of like teenagers they'd been exposed to a lot of adult material and that were behaving in an adult way um we've also got sue palmer who refers to toxic childhood uh, and this is because you've got a damaged kind of like stunted development emotionally because of your over testing in school and the working hours of your parents not being there to support you for long enough and the media impact and junk food and the toxic experience she would say results in the high level of depression anxiety uh, obesity uh, you know self-harm rate that we see in children today and this is the fault of kind of a toxic childhood where you, you're getting too much of a uh, an adult impact in your early life that pretty much concludes where we are up to guys um, and what you have on page number 10 uh, is a breakdown of some views that say that actually things are getting a little bit better um, and childhood is, is is improving and things are better than they were before uh, and then a look at different uh, types of conflict view um, looking at gender and class and ethnic differences uh, and I'd like you to read that when we get to the bottom, there's a guy called Berger and Berger is going to say that youthfulness is a personal quality and an attitude towards life rather than that of a biological age. So I'm going to give you something to watch uh, and the work that you're going to be doing for the rest of the lesson now that you have filled in the booklet uh, is watching this documentary. So what you've got to type into YouTube is cutting edge, fabulous fashionistas. And you are going to watch this documentary. And what I want you to do is looking at the women who are involved there. And it is like a heartwarming documentary. So it's definitely worth a watch. It's only about 40 minutes. Is what um, and how does the case of these fabulous fashionistas support Berger's view? So note down the ways in which the documentary supports Berger's case that youthfulness is just a social construct. Um, it's just something that's made by society. And it's not really important what biological age you are. Um, it's it's maybe your behaviours and the, the culture that you are adopting at the time. Um, that concludes um, that concludes everything for uh, for today. So this is the the final thing that you need to watch. Um, we'll be reviewing this and the stuff that we did last week. When I see you again next week, um, and starting on one of the social theories, um, which is going to be um, looking at functionalism. So that is what you're going to be. Okay, thanks guys.